It's actually noted as one of the finest fishing rivers in the country. And you wouldn't think there would be much pollution here. But in fact, this river, like every other river in Scotland, is polluted with microplastics. Come down from the atmosphere by the vast amount of waste that we produce as a civilization. Now that's just a very short little clip made. And what we're gonna try and do with, over, to do over the next few minutes is just kind of expand what was done to sort of make a clip, this clip or a clip like this. So I'll just, just basically get into it. Now, the first thing I wanna see from the off is, is that we've got these amazing bits of kit, these smartphones, and they're so powerful. They've got such high resolution. They've actually got great little lenses in them, but I think we really must remember their tools and the most important thing to get across to get across here is, is that it's about crafting the message. Even if it's just a few seconds, we, we still got to think about crafting a message, a simple story. And there was none better other than this chap here. And I'm sure most of you recognize him, Alfred Hitchcock. Now he would spend a lot of time honing and crafting some of his classic films, you know, Rear Window, Psycho, and Vertigo, and all these classic films. But he would just plan them out and he actually never looked through the camera when it came to making them because he knew exactly how it was going to look. So that's the kind of point of this little kind of this little sort of slide as it was here is they're great tools. It, they're great things, these smartphones, but they are tools and it's up to us to really craft the message that we're going to sort of put in front of it. Now, I, I, I'm a great believer in using everything we've got already before we go and buy something new because we're, we tend to be a bit of a culture buy something we need to just buy it buy it buy it now this is fine the image on the left absolutely fine if you're a kind of big pro photographer and you're out in the world and you're doing stuff but it kind of misses the point the image on the right is what we're looking at it's it's our phone with a couple of little additions and that's us away and to be honest as i said in the bottom here once you start adding too much gear, it does kill the fun of it a little bit because we just want to get our phones, get them out, capture something, maybe add a bit of audio and get it done. So it's like, let's maximize what we've got before we think about buying anything more for, from that. And that really follows on to this, this here. What I'm saying is when I'm doing a lot of stuff with, with, with my smartphone and filming, you want to make it light. Uh, I actually give myself a limit and my limit is I've got a little tripod and it's got a little bag it comes in. And if it doesn't go in that tripod bag, it doesn't come with me. And you could do the same. You might just set yourself a limit. If it doesn't go in your coat, if it doesn't go in a little rucksack, then it doesn't go with you. And as I said in the bottom, I said in the bottom here, it is mobile technology after all. We don't want to sort of turn it into some lumbering great mound of gear on our shoulders. Keep it small, keep it tight. That's the real, that's the real clincher of this. For the folk out there that are thinking of doing workshops or already are doing workshops with groups, um, there's a couple of little things here just to go through. And this is just from my own experiences of things that haven't worked. And I can tell you there's been quite a few and things that have worked. Think about um, how many participants will you have at it? I find with this type of thing, 12 to 15 in, in an actual physical session is about the limit. Anything more than that, it starts to get a little bit out of control because you've got all this different bits of kit, all this different smartphones and everybody's trying to do this and do that. Like you can't get this to work, can't get that to work. So I reckon 12 to 15 is a kind of limit. Um, the next one is, is how, long you can, how long is your session gonna be? Gonna be an hour or is it gonna be a whole day? And, I, I, I kind of go by this kind of opposite curve. The more people you have, the shorter the session. And so I find that works best. So um, that's what I find works best anyway. And the third one there is, be sure you have permissions. Now, anybody that works in schools or heritage and culture is probably well aware of this, but you know we really do need to get permissions if we're gonna start photographing stuff these days. Um, an obvious one in film, in film land is, is that if you go out and you intentionally go to photograph a building as such, then you should get permission to do it. Whereas if you're photographing somebody in the street and you're doing an interview and, you, and you've got their permission, but the building just happens to be in the background, 
then you're okay. You shouldn't really need permissions. It's just a sort of a byproduct of what you're trying to do. But always just double check. It's, it's up to the individual to be sure they do have permissions in place. And I get this one right up front as well. When you're actually smartphone filming, it's pretty heavy on, on the battery. And I would always right up front say, get yourself an external sort of power charge or a power bank, I think they call them, and you can top up in the move. And of course, don't forget your USB cable, because I've done that before. I've had all the, the power bank, I forgot the, the blinking cable and I was, came a cropper. So that's just a little thing for, for those out there that, that are thinking of doing group session work. And, and I just want to say here, when we're talking about apps, and for the purpose of this little sort of webinar just now, the standard camera app you've got on your phone is actually more than good enough to get fantastic results. Maybe a few years ago, some of them weren't that great, but nowadays the standard camera app is fantastic. I, I probably use it about 90% of the time because it's so easy to use and you can get fantastic results. It's got a great dynamic range. It can do slow-mo, it can capture different frame rates. So, so at the moment, the standard camera app, fantastic. And once you've got some, some little sort of video done, your standard photo app, so you know, once you look, once you've taken a picture, you've taken some video and you look at it in your photo album area, it can probably do some, some decent little bits of editing. So you can crop, you can straighten, you can trim clips, and you can do some exposure and color editing all within the standard photo editing app. Of course, you can get other apps and they have a lot more power and do lots of other things, but I would probably cover that in a more advanced session. And I've actually got this little clip here, hopefully you can all see it, and this is by Edward Moybridge. And he took this clip here of this horse, and it's the first, it's, well, it's, it's, it's designated as the first piece of moving image, not to be confused with, with cinema, which is on film. And that was round about 1878. I don't know if you can just make out in the bottom left corner the numbers going from roughly one to 16. And he basically went down, down to his local racetrack and he set up just normal old fashioned cameras at set intervals. And he got this jockey with his horse, obviously, to run past him. And they triggered the camera by, by kind of crossing a piece of string. And it took 16 separate images and they were put inside this contraption just in the middle here, which if I get it right, it's called a zoopraxia scope. I hope that's right. And that produces, by, by looking in the slits, or you can look down at an angle, you get this idea of a moving image. There was a really interesting byproduct of Edwards actually doing this. Before 1878, if you ever see a painting or a drawing or an etching of a horse in full flight, it looks like the image in the left there, all its limbs splayed out. And it was, only, it was only after Edward Moybridge did this kind of moving image to realize that's not how a horse runs at all. So it's a real neat little bit of kind of information, if it were useless information. You can always tell a painting that's been done before 1878 with horses in flight because it looks like this. And as a consequence, this moving image was known as goodbye flying gallop. But the reason I've got this here is, is because Edward Moybridge was doing this then. He wanted to go out. And what he had to do was so complicated. All we've got to do is pull something out of our pocket to get a moving image. Now, looking into some of this a little technical things, I'm just going to sort of go over some little bits and bobs here. Some of the obvious things. Now, I know probably all of you will probably know this, but it's amazing how often these things are overlooked. Now, if you're like me, you might have your your smartphone in a pack, in your pocket, in a bag. And sometimes there's bits of grit, bits of dirt, and it actually gets caught in the lens. So it's really important to give the lens a little bit of a clean. And if you can, just a bit of, with a little bit of a lint-free cloth. Try not to use tissue, because it actually scratches the lens a little bit. But if you can, a bit of a t-shirt or something like that, if you're struggling. Be sure you've got enough storage because actually video clips actually start to become pretty bulky in size. So if you can empty unused content out of your phone beforehand. Um, 
I always say shoot landscape. Now I know there's lots of there's lots of potential these days to use it in portrait mode. I know Facebook story, the storyline bit has it in portrait, and there's other things. But I think it's a good habit to actually use landscape because it really it's 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 the best use of the physical space. You don't end up with that funny black bars when you're viewing it when you're viewing a proper nice bit of video. But you, again, you don't have to do it in landscape, but it's a good habit to get into. And the last one there is, in my sort of obvious but overlooked is, is put it in airplane mode or silent mode, as I used to call it. And that means and that stops. You're just about to do a nice bit of filming, a nice bit of narration, and I'll, I'm, in pops all these strange pings and pongs from all your apps like WhatsApp and messages. You don't want that happening, so pop it in airplane mode. And this guy I've got on the left here is called Frank Hurley, and he was he was Shackleton's photographer on that very ill-fated endure, endurance expedition in the very early 20th century. And you maybe heard of Shackleton and what his epic voyage of escape from the from Antarctica. And now, in those days, Frank Hurley had to take these really old-fashioned cameras. Now, his still camera, it you it. He had to take with him three tons of glass because it was glass slides that took the picture. So if you think how hard it was for Frank Hurley going to Antarctica with three tons of glass slides and the setup that took, I mean, for us, all we've got to do is, get, is give the lens a bit of a clean, clean out some storage, you know, shoot landscape if we, if, if we need to and put it on mute. It's not, it's, it, compared to what Frank had to do, it's pretty easy. And now, as some of the basic stuff, it's some of the basic it's elements. Now I can start to go in a little bit. And I'm what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go through each of these in turn in the following little little sort of scenes. So what I've got here is movement makes your clips more exciting, lighting is key, expose so your subject looks good, field of view, use the grid, audio, and a picture tells a story. But I'm going to go through each one of these in turn. And the reason I've got this little thing here is, this is called a vest pocket, a Kodak. It's basically the size of, of a smartphone. And it just lets you see there's nothing that new. And there's, there's a rather dapper looking chap. I mean, look, wear it, in your, wear it in your pocket. And it became known as the soldier's camera or the trench camera, because it enabled, it, it enabled basically the public had access to a device that could take an image. And it really revolutionized photography, this simple little camera, the size of a typical, you know, smartphone. And actually in the trenches, photography was, I don't know if it was, if it was officially banned, but it was at least frowned upon. And I'm sure in some cases it was banned, but there was lots and lots of images taken using the little vest pocket Kodak here. So that's exactly what we're doing today. We're just going out there, just trying to capture life. But anyway, Getting back to this, I'm going to go through these in turn now. So movement. Now, there used to be an adage for filmmakers was, was you keep the movement in front of the lens and you keep the camera stationary, keep it still as much as possible. And that was, that was a bit of an old fashioned adage, but however, it, there's a lot of value in that today. And the reason being is that especially with the size of the camera sensor in smartphones, they're very sensitive to motion. So we want to try and keep, if we do have to move them, we want to try and keep our pans and tilts, which is fancy film speak for going side to side and up and down. We want to try and keep our pans and tilts nice and smooth. And it actually does take a little bit of practice. And I find that one of the best ways to do that is to slightly bend your knees, keep your elbows tucked in and Hold, hold the smartphone with both hands kind of close to the body. So movement's important, but, but as much as possible, try and get the movement happening in front of the camera if you can, because it, it stops a lot of jerkiness. But of course, it's, that's not to say we shouldn't move, but if we're gonna do nice pans and tilts, side to sides and ups and down, try and get them nice and smooth if you can. And that's another one of these old fashioned sort of, um, images. This is a slightly different one. This, this was on the flat. It, now, this is a real word here. Let me have a go at this one. Phenakasotoscope. Yeah, that's, that's as far as good as I'm going to get with it. And that was just, that was showing how, how moving, something moving really was interesting people early in photography. Movement was really important. I hope it's not going to scare you. This is Nosferatu. Um, this is on about lighting. And 
I mentioned a little, a, a few, a few seconds ago. There's something with the, the camera sensor. Now that's the bit that actually takes the images, or takes the image, or takes the video. Now with smartphones, that sensor's really small, and what it means is it needs lots and lots of light. And even, even in a medium lighting situation, images can get grainy quite quickly. So. What I, what I find is if you do have to shoot indoors and it's just a little bit, the lighting's not great, try and go somewhere where there's light coming in the room. And again, another one of these sort of filmmaker or photographer adages, you want it coming over the shoulder onto the subject. Now that's not to say you've got to do that for every situation, but nine times out of 10, you want light on what it is that you're actually taking a photo or a video off. And of course, if you can do it outside, all the much more better because you'll get you'll get much more natural light and it's 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 so much better to get that into the lens so that's that's a little bit about lighting exposure now most of most of our smartphones now have have a little thing where you can do the focusing and the exposure all locked in one setting and how that works is and i've got a little clip in a minute that's going to demonstrate it it actually takes much more longer to see it than it does to show it but I'll, I'll go through it anyway. And you've probably done this where you've tapped on the screen and you found that tapping the light areas makes it darker and tapping on the dark areas makes it lighter and so forth. It does the opposite. So wherever, wherever you tap does the opposite. Again, it's about a little bit of trial and error. So have a good experiment with that and just try tapping on different bits on the screen. This was a little bit of rock at a little sort of village harbor. And I wanted to be able to concentrate on the seaweed and the rock. And I wasn't too bothered about the background in the upper part. You can see it's what we call blown out. It's all gone to white. It's all gone very light. Well, I wasn't bothered about that. I was exposing for the bit I was interested in. Because let's remember, the smartphones do have their limits. They've got limits. So you want to get the limit to work in your favor and not against you. This, this is a very interesting one, I find. Because a lot of people used to say to me, well, Robert, I've taken this great image and they showed it to me. And there's this tiny little dot in their camera, this tiny little dot. And that's one of these little optical things because most smartphones have their standard lens is what we call like a wide angle lens. And what that basically means is it's kind of designed to sort of let as much image in as possible, as wide an image as possible. The kind of downside to that, if, if it's a downside, it means that Whatever your eye sees, the smartphone will, gives, will push it twice as far as we. So, you, so if it's a 24 millimeter lens, when you take a picture, that what the camera sees is actually twice as far away as what your human eye sees. So to compensate, we've got to get in tighter to the subject. So don't be frightened to, go, to get in close and actually fill the frame. Now, some of you might be thinking, ah, but my camera's got another lens and it's got another lens. And, and that's true, it does have that. But the reason I tend to stick with the wide angle lens is because it lets in most of the light. As soon as you start narrowing the lens, it cuts down the amount of light you get in. And that means cutting dynamic range. And I tend to stick with the wide lens on my camera, but I try and get as near as possible to the subject. Um, now, Wonky Horizons. That sounds a good name for an album. No, this, this is really looking at sort of um, getting sort of images nice and straight as it were. Now, we don't, want to, we, we don't want everybody just producing nice, lovely, straight images, but sometimes you want to align your image to something. And it's a really simple thing to do. And it's just, it's to set your smartphone to, to show the grid. We've all got these grid now. Yeah, there's up there. And that's showing it without the grid and that's showing the smartphone with the grid. You've got your two horizontal lines and your two vertical lines there. And it's quite a good thing because you can actually use that grid to line up with anything. It doesn't have to be you know, right angles or perpendicular. You could line up to, to angled lines or something like that, but it's really useful to use the camera grid to sort of align to something. So, I'm going to do a little practical demonstration here. This is a clip, and it's hopefully going to show it the past few minutes that I've just talked about, and hopefully it will all come together. So I'm opening the camera app, and I'm showing here that I don't have the grid on, and I'm going to have to go back into my settings and put it on. Now, on the iPhone, it's in settings, camera, and it's grid. 
and I'm going to toggle it back and forth just to let you see that I'm putting the grid on. You might have this setting in your camera app itself, so just have a double check. Now you can see I've got the lines on the phone there. Now I'm tapping to get the exposure. You see the little yellow square? And remember, I was tapping dark to get light, and I'm tapping light to get dark. So I'm tapping dark to get it light. Now, this is quite rough doing this, but it gives you an approximate. Then, hopefully if I settle down, there's a little slider at the side, and not a lot of people really know about that, and you can make fine tuning adjustments to your exposure. I don't know if you can, hopefully you can all see that there. You can do fine tuning to exposure, but the real key is to lock it. So if I tap and hold the screen, there it is, I tap and hold the screen, I get locked, and the locking appears at the top. And that's great, I, I do it again, tap and hold the screen, it locks. And that means then I can fine tune at the side and it's set, no matter where I move the camera, that exposure and focusing is locked. Then I can just take the image I'm happy with. So hopefully that little practical demonstration here just covered the previous few little snapshots we went through. Audio. Now, audio is, audio is quite important, actually. And of course, all, it, the, the, the smartphones these days have much better audio recording capabilities in them. And I'm just going to show you, though, how important it is. There's a clip at the top here, and it's got bad audio. So if it sounds bad, it's meant to. That makes sense. And the one, the one in the bottom has got much better audio. So I'm just going to play the one in the top. It's tranquil scene is of a river in the far north highlands of Scotland. It's actually noted as one of the finest fishing rivers in the country. Now that's muffled audio, and as that red blurb says there, the reason was when I took it, I had my hand over the microphone, so it ends up muffling my voice. So that's why it's quite good to know exactly where the microphone is in your smartphone. It used to be in the bottom, right in the bottom, but sometimes it, it can be in the bottom, but in the front. If you kind of know what I mean, it's in the front, but in the bottom area. So have a check of your smartphone to see where the microphone actually is. So when you are holding it and taking some video, you're not actually blocking it. And of course, this is a much, this is it clear. This tranquil scene is of a river in the far north highlands of Scotland. It's actually noted as one of the finest fishing rivers in the country. So that's just saying. Now, of course, you can get external microphones which you can add to your smartphone and they'll give really, really good um, recording capabilities. But you know what? In most occasions, the standard, the standard microphone's actually fine, it's okay, as long as you don't have a huge amount of noise around you. The one thing I would say though, is if you are using an external mic, you've got to get a particular kind of adapter and, it's, it's, and some microphones need a thing called a preamp. Now this starts getting a little bit technical, but don't worry about it. If you but just maybe have a look at it in Google. But if you are going to get an external mic, do check you've got the right adapter for it, and check that that you that the, that the microphone you are going to get needs some kind of preamp on it. But again, I I'll cover this in a sort of more advanced session. And my my slide here on this sort of section was the picture tells a story, and this is just basically saying that. Even sim a simple, well thought out little clip can actually have a powerful little message to it. And here I actually did do, I did do a portrait one here and it was just a simple reveal. I just did a little reveal of actually Persephone, which is the Greek goddess of the underworld and vegetation, who's up at um, East Acorthian Stone Circle, not far from there. And that's just a little reveal. And it just shows just a little simple clip can actually tell, tell a little story. Going back to people that are maybe think that are working with groups or that are maybe sort of running, running their own courses or thinking of doing their own courses. Um, if we think about how a film is made, if you think about all your favorite TV programs or your films that you might watch on any of the streaming services, there's quite a lot of people involved actually. The main roles would, would center around a director, a kind of camera person, a lighting person, but then of course you've got all the other people that, that maybe have, have written what you're looking at, the people who storyboard it, and that's like a bit like a comic book, it's all little images, and there's obviously a sound person too. So if you are running 
a kind of session and you're, and you're wanting to make a little film, rather than having 12 or 15 people going at it at once, it's a really nice idea to, to make one film but assign roles to everybody. So you might just have one smartphone on a tripod and you assign roles to people. So you might have a director, you might have a, the person that's actually doing the camera work, somebody that's maybe looking at a little bit of lighting, somebody might write it, somebody might do a little bit of, they might draw out how it's going to storyboard it. And you could do it if, if, you, if you wanted to do an external microphone, you could have a sound person. But it's a much more manageable way than trying to do 15 separate films in one session. I tell you, it's much more manageable. But it's a really good idea. And then you can switch rules around. So you could switch the rules around afterwards. So that's a nice little one for, for those out there who are doing workshops and thinking about doing sessions using smartphones to make films. And some sort of miscellaneous items here. Well, I don't think we need too much items to be honest to add to the smartphone. I think um, a tripod is quite important actually. It's, it's quite a handy thing to have. You don't need to spend a fortune on one. If you've got one already, use it. It's, it's, it'll be perfectly adequate. Um, the one good thing is if, if you can have in a tripod is to be sure it's tall enough. There's nothing worse than stooping down all the time. Be sure it can get up to sort of reasonable kind of chest or lower head height. And it, it kind of has a handle on the, we call it the ball head or the bit that pivots round. So you can maneuver, you can do nice pans and tilts yourself with it. So that's a thing to look. If it doesn't have a handle, don't worry about it. You can just keep it stationary. I mean, it's perfectly fine. And you're going to need some kind of adapter to sort of fit around the, the smartphone to hook it onto the tripod. I, I've also, there's been occasions where I've not even had a tripod with me and I've just, I've just used my coat rolled up with a, a travel cushion or a small towel. You can rest it on a wall, rest it on something. Um, a freezer bag, no, it's not for sticking in the freezer, but. If it starts to rain, then you cut a little hole out of the freezer bag and you can pop the camera inside and you can get images in bad weather. And two penny pieces are, are the absolute godsend for filmmakers because all these adapters have little screw nuts underneath them and two penny pieces will save your nails, I can tell you. So two penny pieces, just stick them everywhere. They're really handy. Like I say, you don't need to spend money on an expensive kit. You really don't. And I'm going to go back to that first image I showed you right at the beginning, and hopefully we've got an idea about the things we've covered. These are the elements at the side, and I'm just going to play it again, and hopefully you can pick up on some of those. This tranquil scene is of a river in the far north highlands of Scotland. It's actually noted as one of the finest fishing rivers in the country. And you wouldn't think there would be much pollution here, but in fact, this river, like every other river in Scotland, is polluted with microplastics. Come down from the atmosphere by the vast amount of waste that we produce as a civilization. So that's just the exact same clip at the very beginning, but hopefully you've seen that we've covered the audio, the kind of camera movement, the exposure locking and the focus locking. A nice, simple, clear message. That's very important. I'm just going to finish off talking about that. A nice straight horizon. In this case, it, it works, but you don't always have to have spit. In this case, it worked. Filling the frame. Well, I was really trying to get as much of the river as possible, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy getting that in the frame and I exposed to the subject, which was the river and the general scenery there. So, so that, I thought that, that worked quite well as a, a demonstration little clip to show these points. But my kind of final thought on this little bit of it is to say that, I mean, again, it's an amazing little bit of technology we've got, but we can start to use these, these bits of kit now to hopefully shift a sort of individual and even a collective awareness, if you want to call it, on on aspects of climate change. And there's so many aspects of climate change, but and, we, and even just by our smartphone in our pocket, we can actually create some pretty amazing little microfilms. Um, and, and, and I would say, you don't have to worry about trying to be global and, and trying to get your message to the other side of the planet. Share what's happening outside your front door, because I can tell you there's gonna be some amazing things literally on your doorstep. 
And, and I think, it, 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 my final thought about this is really summed up best by Carl Sagan. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of him. He's a very famous scientist and climatologist from the 1970s, well, 60s, 70s and 80s. And he kind of really brought to the fore the idea of, of, of climate change on this planet through his work with, with various probes, but especially the Voyager probe that went out to Venus. And it went out looking at the climate on Venus because the scientists at the time couldn't quite work out why Venus had such a such a sort of almost disproportionate climate compared to Earth. It should have been kind of closer to our climate, but it was radically different. And they were looking at climate change on Venus to try and understand climate change here. And it was the Voyager probe. And the Voyager probe went out and it gathered some great data. And eventually the Voyager probe came to the end of its life because its batteries were just run down. And it was just probably going to just crash into the atmosphere of Venus and just, just, just as a probe, just disintegrate. And Carl Sagan asked his team if we can just flip the camera around and just get a little image looking backwards. And the camera caught an image of Earth caught in a sunbeam. And this image became known as a pale blue dot. And that's what I just, just want to finish off here by saying to everybody that even with, even just with our smartphones, we can all el eliminate on this little pale blue dot that we call home. And that's just a little, um, little kind of image of it there. That's the pale blue dot there. And that's a sunbeam, actually, a, that's a sunbeam there. And that's, that, that's the Voyager probe, its last few hours of life, just looking back before it dies, sending back to Earth an image of what it sees. And I'm going to finish off this bit of the webinar with Carl Sagan. He made a very famous speech at a conference about the pale blue dot. And I used it in a film uh, a few years ago, um, which I was highlighting man's place in the cosmos and climate and other aspects. And I was using NASA footage. But I'm just going to give you the, the last few seconds, the, the last two or three minutes of a short film that I did. And thanks for your patience in watching this. And I'll hand over after this, after this little clip here, I'll hand over to Alison to hopefully see if we have any questions and I'll do my utmost best to try and get you some good answers. So. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. I shall stop the sharing there, Alison. Yep. Hopefully that came across. Hopefully you got that wasn't too juddery. I know Zoom can be a bitty, uh, bitty kind of laggy. Okay, so we're going to start with Mary. Mary, would you like to ask your question, please? So you should be able to unmute yourself. Can you? Or not? 
Okay, well, ask Mary's question. Have yeah. you got any tips about how long the um, the video should be when when you're actually telling a story? Well, if you come to the next course, you'll find that out. No, and that would be a bit <laughs> shaky. But no, I mean it varies. I mean if it's social media, I think. They, I don't know who they are, but I found general experience. Once you start getting over three, four, four minutes plus, it starts to, it tails off. Aud the audience numbers start to tail off. So three, four, five minutes, something like that. I would say that's kind of three to four minutes would be my, my, my thing. I would personally would have it much longer, but I think the attention span seems to be going like down and down and down. But I think three, four minutes for social media is about, about right. Um, Rachel Cooper, did you want to ask your question? Sure, thank you. Um, so I was um, just wondering, obviously, in, in the current climate, um, we, we were thinking of doing some like interview style um, kind of uh, interaction. So we wanted to get for international, you know, Women in Science Day, people asking, you know, questions uh, and sending it in. And I just wondered how you'd go about doing that, you know, if it was different people filming, um, if you have any tips at all. Was it? Yeah. Are, are, are these people kind of in different locations all over the place or are they? Where are yeah, they? so, so all different countries um, around, around. So from we do a lot of work in Southern Africa, so some in Southern Africa and then some in Europe. Yeah. Well, I, I guess what you could do is if, if there's somebody there that's able to take the clip there. And then see, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a fact. It, the thing that works with that is, is, is and I, don't, I, don't mean, I don't mean a script as, as if you're giving the people what to see, but if you can have it worked out what the kind of interview is, then you can plan all the different clips and put them together. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, no, that, that definitely makes yeah. sense. So, 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 yeah. so you, you, you kind of have to almost, I don't, again, I'm not, I'm not saying you script the people what they respond, but you script the interview, you have to script it. You know, yeah. I would script it out and then then you could piece it together. So you might if you've got people in each of these locations that could there's somebody there who can who can take a clip of that particular response to to a question. And then maybe you can assemble them all together. But is that what you would do with all the clips? Yeah. So what, what we were thinking of, of doing and I saw that the John Muir Trust had done something quite nice. They actually asked a range of people so four different speakers all the same questions and they all answered it and then they, they pieced each answer to the que one question together yeah. um, and it was like I think it must have been done on zoom because they they basically then put it was actually quite cool how, how they did it but um I've I haven't really pieced together much myself so I've just well, used well of yeah. course you've got a recording facility in zoom itself so so you can you can you can get those clips so you so you can record you know, zoom if you, I think you need to have a kind of proper um I, and I don't mean an account as if like a re, like a registered. You've got to like you've got to buy a subscription of Zoom. You've got to pay. I can't remember how much it is. Hundred quid a year. So and then it allows you to record what your you know the session, and then you you can actually get those as as video files. And then of course they have to be edited together. Yeah. So, so it's uh, the, it's the editing. The editing's always the one that is, it's always going to be the bugbear. I'm afraid editing. Yeah, no, for sure. No, that's no, that that that's great. I was just thinking, actually, but you've given me more confidence actually with the phone. So I actually think also a lot of people could, could you know, film it, you know, kind of like you're saying, actually in a landscape format, yeah. um, and then actually send that in and then piece it together. So I think that that would also work quite nicely for filming, you know, outdoors as well. Yeah, I mean, if you've got people in each of the, if you've got someone in each of the locations who you can get to do the recording for you, you know. It's, it's a nice little thing as well. That, that's part of your project and part of the process of what you're doing as well. Excellent, thank you very much. That's okay, okay. Great, so I, I'm gonna ask a question on behalf of Alex. Um, yeah. He's asked if he's better or she's better filming on the highest possible settings, that their phone allows um, 1080 or 4K at different frames per second rates and she doesn't know what she should aim yeah. for. Yeah, I, I mean, it, the, the resolution wars, if, if you're old enough, you, you'll, you'll know a thing called the, the loudness wars. I don't know if you're aware of this. And this is when music went from a certain level volume and it, and it was called compression and it's all by music producers to get music to be louder and louder and louder and louder. We don't have that somewhere. So now we've got the thing called the resolution wars because we've got TVs with 4K, 8K, 16K, 
The, the numbers are meaningless. They're absolutely meaningless. Um, um, I would say for recording, the best thing to do is record in 1080p because that's going to give you an, that's going to give you a nice sort of, a nice quality. Then once you've recorded it, resave it or export it as 720p because that way you're recording down and 720p is absolutely fine. Anything up to a standard size laptop up to up to a kind of small sort of television. In fact, it's fine up on a big television. Most of my, all my films are put out at 720p. There's not one of them is in full HD. If it's done right and it's done properly, you never notice a difference because people are get obsessed about resolution. It, and it, it is a bit crazy. I, I got to say, this is, this, this is driven by the, the tech manufacturers and they're driving this. It tends to be big tech in California who are driving all this. You've got to buy this. You've got to have this. You've got to buy this. You've got to get this. You don't. You don't need it at all. Resolution is, is the X and Y axis. So it's this way by that way. That's not the most important dimension. It's the X axis this way. That's called dynamic range. That's the most important one. But 1080p and then save it down to 720 and use the 720 when you share it and put it on the internet. Brilliant, thank you. So Colin, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, it was just a quick question about Zoom. You you alluded to it just in the in the at the end of the presentation there, Robert. Yeah. Uh, I often find it's juttery and and you knock the 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 mobile device when you put your hands on the touch screen to alter zoom. Would you recommend just avoiding it altogether or is there a way to smooth it? On on zoom, sorry. Yeah, when you're zooming in and out on an image. Oh, as you see, when it's when you're zooming in and out. You don't mean Zoom like, like Zoom we're using here then? You're talking about mm. Zooming in and out? No, sorry. I'm talking about Zooming on Zoom. Ah. But no, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean Zooming in and out on, a, on an image. Yeah, Zooming in and out on an image is quite a difficult one. I don't do it. I don't Zoom in and out. I tell you, I, and what I do is I move in and out. Does that make sense? Yeah, you physically yeah. move closer or... I physically move closer. Now, the point is, obviously, if something's really far away, you're going to have to do an awful lot of moving, you know? You're going to have to and they can get your skates on. If it's just moving a little bit, it's fine. Um, zooming tends to be a thing. Like in, in film world, it tends to be frowned upon. I don't know why, but it tends to be. I... I, I, I do Zoom, I, I, use it on, I use it on professional, kind of what you call professional video cameras. They're a bit unpopular these days, camcorders. I love a camcorder. Can't beat a good old, but I love a camcorder. Now I do use a Zoom and a camcorder. They've got to be locked down though, and they have to be fixed because the problem is with smartphones, the littlest of motions and it just goes into it. But if, you, if, if what you're Zooming to is not too far away, move in. Does that make sense? Yep, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. They call, it, they call it dolly. They call that a dolly shot. So zoom is when the lens is actually magnifying. But when you're actually moving at the same focal length, they call that a dolly, a dolly. Right, right, Robert. We've got the next question. Yeah. And Amy, do you want to ask a question? Hi, Robert. Thank you for a really oh. informative session. Um, <laughs> I've got, I've got a question. Um, I need to rephrase it because I did put on the chat function, how do you um, muffle wind, but that could be misinterpreted. So how do you um, stop background noise on a smartphone um, aside from just not going out when it's windy? Yeah, it's, it's, it, 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 it's um, is it Liz, sorry, no, Amy, Amy. Amy, yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's always a tough one, audio, Amy. Um, the thing is, what most folk would do is, um, first scenario, you, you, you try and go somewhere where there's no noise if you can. That would be the first preference. If that's not possible, second preference is external microphone. If it's just yourself, you want like one of these little lava, what they call lavaliers, which is a, it's either done by it's either done by a sort of a, like a signal or a wire. And if you've, you've seen the news readers have one with a little the little sort of crisp rice crispy thing or on, on their cheek there that. If that doesn't work, the other option is to get somebody to get an external audio recorder. Now, what I've done, Amy, is 
what I've done is when it's so bad is I've recorded the video with no audio whatsoever and I've recorded the audio afterwards and I've added the two together. Does that make sense? So I recorded the audio somewhere where it was nice, where it was a similar type of environment, but obviously quieter, you know. So say I was recording out the, say I was recording somewhere, but there was building works nearby. Well, I'm, it's going to be hopeless, but I went somewhere else and I recorded the audio and I got the audio and added it on. I will be doing, I'm going to do an, a, a, more, a slightly more advanced one to show you how you can add text and how you can combine different clips together. So have a look for that. But if it's not possible, for, it, the, the first preference, go somewhere where it's quiet. If, if, if that's not possible, do them separately. Brilliant. Thanks, Robert. So, Jess, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks for this, first of all. Okay. Um, I was just wondering what software you would recommend for video editing. Um, are you talking video editing on your computer or on the phone? At the moment, I edit on my computer, but um, recommendations for either would be great. Um, I think there's something called Movie Maker. Is it PC or Mac? Uh, PC. PC. I think there's a, there's a piece of software called Movie Maker, I believe. I must admit I'm Mac and I know um, I should, probably should know more about PC stuff. Um, but th there are plenty sort of video editing packages. Um, the, the, the Mac used to have like um, iMovie for sort of just folk that dabble and stuff. Um, but I think there's one called Movie Maker. Try that one or have a look okay. at it. I would try and get download a kind of trial version first though. You know, don't, don't just go and pay for something and then find, oh, I don't like this, I can't use it. Try and download a trial version of something first. Okay, thank you. Okay. Brilliant. So Ross, do you want to ask your question? Hello there. Uh, sorry, I missed the, the start of your talk. I couldn't get connected. Uh, I think my question might be a wee bit advanced, but maybe if you could give us like some thoughts on uh, making cuts when you're editing and, and how you choose uh, what transition you choose and you know what sort of length between your cuts to, to sort of form what kind of narrative. Um, oh no that, that kind of really depends upon the subject matter Ross you know it, it kind of depends on sort of um, sort of so you're talking about sort of like the cuts between different shots different clips that type of thing. Yeah, um, well, I don't know if you've read the book called In the Blink of the Eye, In the Blink of an Eye, I think it's called. And, it, and he talks about how uh, each cut is like a blink and each time you blink, it's like a different thought, you know, and, and, and how the pace of that can affect the sort of mood and, and, and narrative. I did a short film, Ross, called, um, called Last Footsteps of Home. And the whole film was based upon a girl's blinking eye. So I'm gonna put a link, okay? And have a look at it, and you'll get an idea how I did how I did the cuts and how I did the edits. I used um, I used. Do you remember these old Republic serials? Maybe when you were I don't know how old you are. I don't mean you remember them the first time round, but you remember them, these old Republic serials from the nineteen thirties, like Flash Gordon and all these things. You've ever heard of these? Yeah, uh -huh. they used to have little transitions that go like that. Now the Star Wars new franchise use all these transitions. They go like curtains opening and closing. They call, they call them wipes and fades and that all comes from the old republic serials so they can be really neat that type of thing for sort of changing scenes and changing sort of thing changing tones you know sort of changing clips and that now they used to say that um let me get this right they used to say for sort of transitioning they used to sort of say you use transitions when you're sort of changing time, when you're showing time, and it's just straight edits when you're going between clips. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a, it's like a chapter. It's like a, a turning yeah, of a page, yeah, almost, yeah. is it? You used yeah. to say sort of like slow transitions would be sort of, if you're showing a, a great passage of time, if you're, just, if you're just showing something that's in sequence, it's just straightforward edits. You don't even have any transitions between them. They're just cuts between them. But I'll put that link to Last Footsteps of Home and you can see how I did the eye basically was somebody's eye opening and closing as almost like a shutter. Brilliant. Yeah. Great. Now, we've, I'm just going to ask um, for John. He says, on a photo mode, you can switch the picture from front view to selfie, but you can't do that on video, or can you? You can, actually, I think. Quick... So, sorry, I, I can actually speak. It was just I thought all the questions were going in that way. Uh, 
when you're out, but when you're looking and you're setting up your camera, you can choose to go from front view or or selfie sort of view. Yes. And I just find if if you're speaking to to people, sometimes <clears throat> to have a look when you're speaking, if you can flip the camera back to you, do a little bit of narrative, and then switch it back so you can show what you were speaking about. Yeah. That that seems to work. But then when you start filming, it doesn't seem to be available when you're actually filming. It's only available before you start filming. Yeah. That's an iPhone 6, so yeah. it maybe is on, on the later iPhones. Uh, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think once you're, once you're sort of filming one direction, one way, I think you're kind of stuck with it because obviously okay. I think it's recording that way and then you'd have to sort of... But you could just do them as, as I said to Amy, you could just do separate little clips and then just... Uh, and then splice. Just splice them together using a little app on the phone. You've got an iPhone yeah. 6. I, I, ah, it's an iPhone 6, but I, I mean, it's, it's way behind the, the newer iPhones. They're an awful lot better with the. Yeah, but I, I, I just moved up from a. An, I've, only, I've, got, I've only got an iPhone 8. Uh -huh. I don't have. I don't have. I mean. No, 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 no. no. I, I, I'm fine. It takes good quality video. It, yeah, it's yeah, fine yeah, for yeah. that. And, and the sound is reasonable quality. Yeah. The, the only other thing I was going to say is that uh, somebody bought me for my Christmas uh, remote shutter switch. Oh, yes. And it, it works on video as well. So you can set it up in the tripod. You can come into shots where you want to be rather than behind the camera yeah. and set it going or rely yeah. on the timer. And That's you can switch it off exactly when you want. So I, it was, I, I just found it extremely useful and it was maybe something that other people would find yeah. useful. Yeah, I would, again, that's, I mean, exactly. I mean, you can also use your, 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 your in the days when you got the actual proper headphones with it, you could use the headphones to do the shutter as well, you see. Remember the headphones wire with the, the little thing with the, with the bit you spoke was, it, it could do that. But with these new Bluetooth things, you can't do that anymore. I know, and I know, and they took out, they took out the- Right, right, I'm gonna move it on because right, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. eight o'clock and I, I'm gonna try and get through, we're gonna stop taking questions now, but we'll try and get through the questions that we have well, if people don't mind waiting a little bit longer. Claire, do you want to ask your question? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been trying to film myself um, for to put on Google Classroom for pupils. So I film myself outside. It's not for a whole lesson. It's just an introduction. Yes. Because yes. I like to do it in the countryside when I take my dog for a walk in the morning. But I find it really difficult to hold the phone. Maybe yeah. John's yeah. maybe John's uh, question answered that that you buy the remote shutter switch or something. Maybe I have to try that because I'm trying to hold the phone out in front of me. Yeah. And then film myself. It's quite tricky, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've seen you can also, if you're, you, know, you could also get a little gadget as well if you want, you know, to prop the phone in. You get these sticks, don't you? You could use a stick as well. And sometimes they have a built in little button that does the shutter oh, right. as well. You know what I mean? You can get them for about like six, seven pounds, a real cheap one. And it's got like a little remote shutter thing, pretty, you know, like a selfie stick, basically. Yeah, okay. And it's got, it's got the little shutter thing on it and you can, you don't even have to go up and press the button and you could just click the thing on the stick at the base where your thumb is and you're, you're away. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, so Liz has got the next question, Liz. Hi there, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just have a really brief explanation of ISOWB and what those mean. Can you say that again? Could, I, you, could you explain what ISO and WB are? Those are settings on my phone, which is an Android. Unfortunately, they're not available for the video. They only um, work for stills, but... Oh, ISO, ISO. ISO. Yeah, ISO. Oh, I might, that might need a little bit of time. ISO comes from the olden days of photography when it was like this sort of film grain type of thing, you know? ISO is like how light sensitive the film is. Right, so why would that be needed on a digital? Because um, it's, it's a way of a sort of adjusting, it's a way of adjusting the, sort of the sensor. It's got, it's, got, it's got an equivalent way of adjusting the sensor to compensate for different situations, for different okay. things. Okay, so it's, it's not, it's not light and dark or um, exposure. It, it's part of the exposure, yeah. I mean, exposure is not one thing. Exposure is lots and lots of different things altered together to give lots of lots of different things are altered to give you the exposure. A lot of okay. people get confused because they think exposure is just one thing. You say exposure is a combination of them all. Okay, got you. Um, yeah. 
would you suggest then a complete amateur like me just uses the automatic settings? Yeah, I mean, if, if you're starting out, absolutely, just get the automatic settings. Modern smartphones tend to be a little bit heavy. So that's, do you remember when I did the slider with the, the little yellow thing, I was taking it down? Yes. I would, I would under, under expose it a little bit because modern smartphones tend to be a little bit, they, they be a bit toppy, they kind of blow out a little bit. So draw them down. Draw Unfortunately, down. my Android phone doesn't have a, have a, a light sort of thingy like you showed us. Yeah. I haven't been able to find that. This is, this is why I was wondering because yeah. um, I thought these were alternatives. Yeah, or just They're tap on the screen, just tap somewhere where you can get it just a little bit sort of not too bright, if you see what I mean. Just tap somewhere where you can get the exposure just to come down a bit. I don't think it allows that. Oh, right, okay. Is it an old, old phone? No, no, it's a Motorola Power, a Moto Power. All oh, right, okay. It's about two years old. Oh, that should be fine, it should be plenty, yeah. There just doesn't seem to be that setting. If you put it in automatic, you might get that setting. No. No? No. Oh. no. Have you tried? No, I... Yeah, I would just try looking it up on the internet. It's You're bound to get something if you look it up. Yeah, you know. Okay. And I'm Thank sorry, you. I can't obviously do every no. single individual phone. It's quite tricky because, you know, yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. okay so, so, Andy, let's move on because <laughs> we're, get, we're get, it's getting, it's getting on. Andy, mm. do you want to ask your question? Oh, you just yeah, do you ever use a gimbal or steady calm type thing? To... Um, gimbals are good. No, I don't use steady cams. I'll tell you why. Have you ever tried using a ever using a steady cam in the northeast of Scotland? <laughs> they're fine and sunny. They're fine in, in sunny California where it, there's not a breath of wind. I I bought a five hundred pound um, steady cam. Um, I first time used it on the shore, and the camera was almost upside down, and that went in the cupboard. So I'm, just, I'm not. But no, gimbals are better than than your steady cam forget a steady cam unless you're buying a very very expensive one i i just i just wondered um just just for helping um as you say you move and that you don't use um you don't change the zoom on your on your phone i like, tend not to do it i tend to just move myself if i can yeah yeah so a, a gimbal might be just better to, to get a yeah. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, if, if, if you can't sort of do it physically, if, I mean, I just hold the, the, the phone very tight to my body, bend my knees. You look a little bit daft, but don't worry about that. You get a nice image and just move yourself in and out. If you've got if you've got a proper like smartphone gimbal, you can get one for about 70, 80 pounds. They're, they're actually quite good. Great. OK, so Alex has said um, that there's an act called double take for later iPhones that allows you to film both back and front camera. So that's oh, something you can yeah. Well, yeah, um, yeah. And also um, for Liz, I think, um, Steve has said WB means white balance to compensate for indoor light. And both Liz and to Alan, I think that the people are suggesting maybe a better phone, a camera app on your phone. Robert, are there any camera apps that you could recommend then if you don't have the capability on your actual camera like um i think alan said he's got a new fairphone 3 i'm not sure about the cap the capacity of that um because i because i'm because this session's really about video the, the, the app that i would go for is called filmic pro now it is quite an advanced app um but it's a very very good app and i, I i've actually used that in, in some films because i didn't have a wide angle lens and i wasn't going it, I wasn't going to spend eight hundred pounds for something that I was going to use once for just a couple of seconds. So I used it. I used the app on the phone. Filmic Pro you get for you get for Android and for um, Apple. Very, very, very good app. Would but you pop a, it into the chat? Yes, yes, I that will. That might help people. Um, yeah. Okay, guys. So I think that's all the questions, which is great. Um, now, Robert is, as I say, doing another um, bit on the 18th about creating social media content, but he's also suggested in this one as well that he's going to do a more technical um, workshop, another one, to go into more detail. So we'll post, detail, yeah. post some details on about that later on. Is that right, Robert? Are you keeping this chat open a little bit for me to add some? I am. I am. And I don't know if people are aware, but you can save the chat down the bottom on the right. So if you want to save the chat, you can, or just copy and paste bits. That's also good. Um, 
so hopefully we'll see you again for climate week yeah. northeast if not our climate cafe before then um thank you very much for coming and a huge thank you to robert that was really really good i've learned a lot um yeah. and i'm sure that everyone else here has too um so that's it in the chat now is it has it gone in the chat i've added the film with cool there um and Andy's saying about this, and a few other people saying about it in there. I ha I can't see yours in the chat. Robert. Sorry, um, I can't. The, you said you were going to pop in the the name of the app so people can. Oh, I thought I'd added. I thought I'd added the list to it. I'll do it again. I put a big thing. Filmic Pro. It's a link. Filmic to... Pro. Oh yeah, that's it. File, yeah, Filmic Pro. That's Steve put it in. Great. Thank you. All right, then we're going to finish off there. And thank you. And have a very good night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Video.